prisons. You know, if, if you think of New England, it is the prime college and university region of the United States. And we're getting more and more colleges, largely through the students. And what we're trying to do, working with institutions, prisons, schools, colleges, a huge number of hospitals. And Boston itself is one of the most important hospital research medical centers. We're trying to create demand for local products by requiring our institutions to buy local. And if we can do, you know, I put on my economics hat, if we can chin up demand, the market will meet that demand. The market needs good signals, not crazy signals. My experience has been that farmers understand this and they will do what they have to do to meet that demand. And I would urge Canadians, and you know, you don't have a lot of Holland and you know and UPEI, but just look at the array of institutions you have in the healthcare sector and other sectors. Use them to demand PEI, clean, healthy, local food in your institution. And start with 20%, and then you go up to 40%, and it, it grows and grows. Generate demand. Use your public dollars, your tax dollars, to, as leverage to create the demand that farmers in the province will clearly meet. A little of it, but I have to tell you that uh, the, the land grant university in the agricultural school at the University of Maine in Oregon, which is the flagship of the system, and they have a new food science laboratory. But candidly, um, how do I say this? There, there's a potato hegemony in Maine agriculture, so they will be working on more products. Um, first for potatoes. Okay, we've got to do a lot more with our, our wonderful blueberry sector, uh, wild blueberries. You know, in a lot of ways we look alike, um, and uh, that's very important. Um, univer the, the university sector uh, can play a very powerful role in research sector in new product design, new product development. Um, but I, I can't tell you too, the, the great ag school in California is the University of California at Davis. I know the institution very well. And they were sued about six years ago because they developed a machine which could pick tomatoes more rapidly than, than farm workers. And the question became among Californians, you're using our money to displace farm workers with machines, we're not sure we like that. And there's a very big question about the social consequences of, um, of, of some of the research. Um, but I, I can also tell you that there's a two-year practical act school at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. They were going to close it. Today, the, the enrollment is booming and they're building new dormitories because so many young people want to get into the food system one way or another. I am just overwhelmed with, opportunity, with, with, with the opportunities young people are creating. We're seeing more folks come. The state does help them acquire farmland. The farm trusts, which are very important in the United States, particularly the American Farm Trust, but the main farmland trust seeks to secure a land base to help the young farmers acquire a land base uh, without, without having to put their money there, but they can put it in technology machines and stuff like that. So I'm, I, I, I'm just seeing stuff bust out all over, and it's very, very encouraging. Um, and a lot of it, frankly, happens in spite of the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're staying up. Okay, we're going to come back here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my name is Jordan McPhee. I, I had a small four acre farm business last year. I actually worked with Phil uh, this year at the Farm Center, which is an eight acre community introduction garden uh, in the Farm Center down the road. 
Um, and you know, if you asked me uh, two years ago or a year ago, maybe even like six months ago, I, I would have thought the solution to the, the food system problems that we face today is small scale organic agriculture. I thought that was the only solution. But when I, looking at the scale of how much food actually needs to be grown, just like we have seven billion people today, like the, the man from the Dallas House Engineering School, and we, I mean, we're gonna have like nine billion people by 2050. And an average supermarket goes through half a million dollars of food in a week. So millions of supermarkets all over the world. There's a huge demand, and I don't think small-scale organic agriculture can ramp up the production in the time needed. So really, my, my, the question I want to ask is about scale and size. Is the, the increased scale of farms over the last few years, where 100 years ago, 50-acre farms would have been seen as large. Today, 3,000 acres on PEI is seen as relatively small compared to some of the farms in Ontario or Iowa. Um, is that a, a major factor in some of the problems we face, or can we actually transform the practices of large-scale of, of large farms with technologies of efficiency, like the man from the engineering school mentioned? Are there things that we can do to improve soil health, like even things that have been practiced over the last like millennia, like cover crops and crop crops? <coughs> can these things all be implemented and work together to increase the sustainability of large scale farms while also increasing the viability of farmers' livelihoods? Phil, did you want to speak before they address that? Uh, well, actually, uh, I guess my question. I'd like to frame it in context of the comments first. Which is a good follow-up to what Jordan just said. Um, so if you don't mind, Jordan. Right? Yeah, um, yeah I, I manage the Farm Center in Legacy Garden. And, uh, actually, last weekend, I uh, facilitated a discussion on scale in terms of uh, food production at a local economy conference. And uh, I guess with the work that I've been doing over the last several decades, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to uh, work with and, and listen to, you know, all various perspectives on the sector. And it seems like there's a common understanding of the problem. You know, population growth, resource depletion, climate change. You know, for the most part, I think we all agree that there's issues around these things. But it seems to be like a, an almost schizophrenic response to how we're going to deal with it. And, and I would suggest that before we start emphasizing strategy, that we develop a common vision of what it is we want to see. And I really like that Mark suggested that stewardship and social responsibility go hand in hand. Um, you know, I think that we've really, you know, gone through all these various ages of, kind of technology, computers, et cetera, et cetera. We're in an age of responsibility where it's really no longer good enough to do less harm. That we have to develop enterprises that are solving some of these solutions that we face. And, you know, so, but I'm concerned about the idea that you know, we need to end the cheap food policy while at the same time there's concern about food security and the issues of income inequality. I think there's a hell of a lot of money in the food system. It's just the lack of the distribution. There's too much money going to too few, which is why I think farmers and consumers are starting to go toward CSAs and farmers markets. In fact, farmers markets are the fastest growing sector of all retail in North America. Okay. Um, so, you know, and I also want to encourage you to stop using the word alternative food system because as, as long as we frame it in the context of alternative, people will always look at it as an alternative, not mainstream. So, you know, I guess the question that, that I have is that when we look at all of these things, and the fact that, you know, the vast majority of the world's food is grown by small farmers or entrepreneurial direct market, you know, over two thirds of the food in the world that people consume is consumed from those people, 
not the type of food system that we're used to. So is, is the issue to emphasize the technocratic sort of corporate model of uh, green revolution that we need to feed people or is the emphasis should it be on allowing access to land so that young farmers and new farmers can, you know, have access to land and so that people can feed themselves? So that is a congruent sort of question to the one that you just asked for. So would anyone like to comment on that and perhaps I certainly enjoyed uh, a lot of uh, good information. <coughs> but uh, now that in PEI, uh, we have an immediate problem uh, between commercial farmers and uh, say other people and, uh, and also uh, the fishermen. And, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, I, I would suggest that uh, we uh, don't go uh, too much on theory uh, of uh, a, a lot of scientific theory and uh, just say let's, uh, let's do something. What, what can we do right now that uh, will kind of go into effect for the crop here planted uh, in the spring. And uh, <clears throat> like I, I've been uh, watching uh, the last 10 years, and uh, occasionally uh, there's a, a recommendation for uh, the slope of the row, uh, the, the row crop. And, uh, it's very simple, the thing that, uh, you know, water and uh, rain will, will run downhill. And uh, so the, the farmers should be, or, or there should be a policy of the provincial government that the, the slope of the rows would not be over a certain percentage. Uh, like I would say, uh, somewhere between one and two percent. You see, we had a study on agriculture about uh, years ago, and they said you could grow on nine percent slope, but they didn't say which way to put the rows, and uh, that was a big mistake. And uh, so, and in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, every case uh, of fish gills, go back to where the, the, the washout from a certain road came. And, uh, but this is provincial policy, and I know it's, it's going to be a long time before it will come, because, uh, you know, uh, farmers uh, don't like to be told what to do, and uh, the, farm, the agriculture department uh, doesn't want to tell farmers what they have to do. So it's a big problem. But anyhow. So what you're asking though is when we're thinking about long-term strategies, to also keep in mind that we need to take action yeah. immediately. Right. Okay. Any, any final concluding response to these questions before we ask Eric Kiley to come up and perform her rapporteur duties? Thank you very much. Any, any if you had that magic formula, pretty common. Uh, if we were to ensure on PEI that uh, fall plowing was eliminated and we had cover crops go a long ways towards the uh, And I, I would know in our area the largest land owner, as soon as one crop
we would need to to have more intelligent um, use of the land on every farm. But Phil's point, I, I don't want to skip it. Um, the food strategy for New England, the vision, calls to bring in about a million acres of forest land into agricultural production. Um, in, my, in my home state of Vermont, in 1890, 90% of the land was cleared for agriculture. A hundred years later, it was 90% in forest cover. Almost all of New England is done that. Maine is the most heavily forested state in the United States. But a lot of that forest land is really out of inactive agriculture. We want to create a greater uh, potential agricultural land base. And people in the developing world know this. The forest is a bank for future agricultural land. And we're very, very concerned about the access uh, for young people to access, be able to access agricultural land. That's one of the things, we have a lot of land trusts. There are 96 different land trusts in the state of Maine. Um, one just gave over 300 acres to the federal government to, uh, right next to Baxter State Park uh, to create a national monument that President Obama just put into place. Uh, this is Roxanne Quimby of Burt's Bees, a great gift to the people of the state of Maine. Well, the, the land trusts are now trying to open up their land with contract to young farmers so they can use some of the land that the land trusts have. Likewise, and this gets to your point, we have an aggressive program in most states to purchase uh, agricultural land development rights. And if you look at the price of a piece of farmland and you separate its development right, it's amazingly expensive and it's very close to actually buying the farm. And remember, when you go to a bank, the bank doesn't care that you have a harvest store, doesn't look at your equipment, Want, the bank wants to know what is the land worth. And a number of states, particularly Maryland, has done an, an incredible job, and New Jersey too, with its Green Acres program, of using public money that the public votes on to purchase the development rights from farms. And so farmers can then sell the land in the open market to another farmer, but the development rights are retired, and they belong to the people of the state of New Jersey. For Maryland. Likewise, we have a big program in Maine uh, for um, Oklahoma um, ah. um, it's, it's getting, it's, it's not totally severing forever, but buying for five years or ten years that farmer's right to develop the land. So the farmer gets money up front. Um, and what we're trying to do and figure out is when farmers want to retire in Florida, how do we help them cash in in a socially responsible way that still leaves us, um, still leaves us the land and gives them the equity that they deserve? Not a lot of people realize this, but in the United States, farmers don't get Social Security. <clears throat> farmers don't have a lot of the uh, safety net that I have. And I think the other thing that we've talked about may just, and it was a tough struggle to pass a living minimum wage, but it's only going to be $15 by 2018, the governor proposed it. Almost every economist who looks at this issue basically says, well, what we could do is lift almost everybody in the United States out of poverty who is working with a $22 minimum wage. Now, I know that sounds absolutely nuts, but at the end of the day, we have to fight the fight on several different fronts. Uh, this is an issue that's tied to incomes and poverty, which is an issue tied to this, which is an issue tied to that. We've got to have a larger, if you will, a system to hold this next strategy. Um, we could eliminate food insecurity with a real safety net income system and we don't have it. I've, I've studied the Swedish system extensively, the Finnish system. Uh, it's incredibly hard to reach in those countries. 
which is why Abba and Bjorn Borg are now in Monaco and not in Sweden. But it's also incredibly difficult to be poor. And I think my sense is Canadians do a far better job of that than, than we Americans do in the United States. You, you, I think intellectually and emotionally may have turned the corner earlier than we have. And I think we're going to go backwards, unfortunately. Um, remember, you know, he wants to eliminate Obamacare. 22 million Americans who never had health insurance and fall into poverty largely because of a health crisis in the family now have health insurance. And I fear we're going to go backwards. We're going to lose it. 22 million people now have health insurance. That's an amazing thing to happen in a few years. So I think it, one's got to fight the fight on several levels. Um, I've done too. I've said too much. Well, one, one thing that the NFU has recommended, and, and, and in the United States, the National Farmers Council, or something like that, um, is, to, is to consider farming a public service, just like teaching, just like working in a hospital, just like being a police officer or a firefighter. You're part of the public service, so you should be receiving something of, of, uh, of uh, income as a public servant. You're producing food for your country. But we do that. <coughs> we do everything on, a lot of things on the cheap. We don't pay teachers. We don't pay nurses. We don't pay farmers. That's why the cheap food policy, I think, is part of the problem. Uh, you know, we expect them to do all of this for us for next to nothing. No, you can't send your kid to college. You're a farmer. No, you can't go to Florida every once in a while. You're a farmer. You can't, you know, uh, send your kid to college. You're a farmer. Um, we don't recognize the real worth, the, the wealth that people really create. And uh, a lot of us would like to move to a wealth and consumption tax system, uh, which we really look at. That's my last comment. And that also reduces the ability of farmers to innovate because they can't take risks. Don't, if you try to buy off of your path to try other things that might make you more efficient in the long run or make you have better products in the long run, you can ruin your business if you make the wrong decision. But if you have a <coughs> more efficient, you can improve the food system and you can provide more food while also having a viable business. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that despite the fact we haven't exhausted the topic, we've exhausted the people that possibly are. So I'm going to ask Eric. Uh, who's on our executive at the IIS and who works for the province and is one of the graduates of our master's program uh, to give some thoughts on the Good evening, everyone. First off, thank you to our presenters who this evening gave us their time, shared their knowledge and insights, and engaged us in this important discussion on PEI's food system. A special thank you to our audience. Could you use the uh, microphone? Sorry, Bill. Thank you. Can you? Really, I think Loud voice. Some of us get old. <laughs> <laughs> and special thank you to our audience, especially for the thought provoking and constructive dialogue that we shared here tonight. And thank you to the Institute of Access for hosting this evening's symposium. Dr. Lapping set the stage tonight for a collaborative exchange of thoughts and ideas. He advocates for a holistic or systems approach to viewing the food system. He highlighted the importance of understanding how sustainable agriculture is an Role in achieving healthy individuals, healthy families, and healthy communities. Mr. Cunmore and Mr. Bernard, with the diverse backgrounds and experiences, thank you for sharing those tonight. Um, your examples of how to move to farm, you shared examples tonight of how move to farm sustainability can be possible and productive. And thank you both, uh, especially for your passion and dedication to you know, you guys uh, to providing healthy food to Islanders across our province. And lastly, Dr. Walton closed off the panelist component of this evening's session, discussing, discussing her research, experience, and ideas for enhancing food literacy and food skills. During this evening's uh, panelist discussion and the questions that followed, I think a few key themes seem to have surfaced. Um, I'll try to briefly highlight these briefly. First is that a systems approach and a holistic view um, are going to be necessary to deal with the challenges we face in our food system. Day. Whether it is through land use policies, land use decisions, whether it is through food policy, whether it is through adopting even a systems approach on the farm itself. Um, as Mark spoke about this evening, 
whether it's addressing stewardship and social justice, this will all be part of solving these larger issues and challenges we face. Secondly, transitions in large systems tend to be tend to be taken in incremental steps. The seven elements of the food system that Mark shared with us here tonight serve as a great focal point for the conversations. Strides can be made in many areas, whether it's through branding or through value-added products. Um, Mark B's comment struck me particularly about the skills and talents that are required that are required to be a good producer, and then you have to take off that hat and have skills and talents to be a good marketer. And that's where these supporters, which are really well illustrated in the middle of Mark Lapping's diagram, need to step up um, and support farmers so they don't have to do it all. Um, thirdly, interest in food is growing. Um, the public is becoming more and more concerned about where their food has come from and what they're putting into their bodies. Um, the awareness of social issues around food is becoming more well known. And as Colleen mentioned, we're seeing improvements in food literacy. This leads me to a next related point that, uh, sorry, I have such bad chicken scratch, <laughs> that we as consumers have a very important role to play. Um, it is up to us to be willing to pay the additional costs to provide organic products because obviously the work that has to be undertaken to provide those products has to be accounted for. And this is a responsibility that we can take uh, by the decisions we make. But unfortunately, this is my last point, uh, many individuals don't have those abilities to exercise uh, those choices as consumers. Food insecurity is a major issue in our province, and we do our best to try to respond to the needs, but how do we fix and address the problem? Tonight, there was uh, many examples raised, some wonderful ideas, um, really the idea of building food literacy and food skills, and that education might be uh, one of the paramount ways to address some of these challenges. Um, a small disclaimer, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, I am not a farmer, I have very little success in growing food of my own, and I am not very well versed in sustainable agriculture, the complexities and intricacies of the food system, or nutritional science, but I'm a mother and I can help I'm an aunt, and I assume everyone else in this room here tonight has special people in their lives that they care to be about. It is not until very recently that I have realized the importance of good health and what a privilege it is to have accessibility to healthy and nutritious food choices. We must continue to seek understanding of our food system and the links between a healthy food system and healthy bodies and healthy minds. I also care deeply about this province, as I assume many people do in this room. We must continue to seek an understanding of our food system and the links that it has with our environment, our economy, our livelihoods. I think that uh, following the presentation tonight, it's fair to say that the food system is ever complex. And as we all know, change in complex systems can seem daunting, if not impossible. But over time, all systems, whether we like it or not, are changing and evolving to cope with environmental, economic, and social impacts. Um, we have decisions to make about whether we will act out of extreme necessity, which is usually shocking, jarring, or radical, or whether we will act with foresight and vision, as mentioned this evening. Um, maybe allowing change to be more gradual, comfortable, and incremental. This evening's symposium has been a great opportunity to gain an understanding of what sustainable agriculture may look like for PPI, as well as the impacts of moving to such a food system could have on our health, environment, and our economy. It is opportunities like this this evening where constructive conversations take place, where middle ground can be sought and presented, and where we can hear a range of perspectives that will help us look clearly at barriers to and opportunities for change in our island's food system. It is opportunities like this that will help us move forward in exploring our food system of today and imagining the food system of tomorrow, a food system that we would perhaps like to see for our children or grandchildren or loved ones to come. Closing, thank you to all, and as our chair, our panelists, and our audience for being part of this important conversation. I'm sorry to do this, but I hope to leave tonight with some food for thought <laughs> that will lead to further dialogue and discussion on this important topic. Good night.